Tell me which is easier. To say his sins are forgiven. Or say he... Get up. And walk. What's up? Uh, Trey's here with me and Nate to discuss C.S. Lewis's book, Miracles. And uh, we're going to discuss the basic argument he makes for um, the plausibility, the possibility and plausibility of miracles and of the source of miracles, God, that he makes in that book. Uh, it's a really great book. Um, it's a really solid reputation of naturalism as C.S. Lewis defines it. So to lay some groundwork, um, one of the first points C.S. Lewis makes in the book, like it's within the opening sentences of the book it makes the point that um, seeing is not believing so we can't merely look to history to determine whether or not miracles have happened um, because we're always going to be reading history or our own experiences in light of certain philosophical assumptions even if they aren't recognized as such so he makes the point that he only knows one woman one person who uh claimed to um who has claimed to seen a ghost and um she disbelieved in ghosts both before and after the experience. So it's only, it's a matter of what do you uh, think plausible about the nature of reality? And that's going to color how you read any phenomenal experience or historical evidence for miracles. So it's important that we get our definitions down and actually drill down into philosophical issues first. So the way C.S. Lewis defines naturalism is basically... Um, that naturalists purport that there is this great process of becoming that exists in space and time and nothing else exists. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so supernaturalism is that something other than this great process of becoming um, exists and is behind it. Mm -hmm. So uh, basically naturalism for him is, is this belief in um, this kind of mechanistic, a whole, which composes all of rea reality, total reality. And there's nothing outside of that. Right. Now, it's important to recognize that this distinction between supernaturalism, as in there's something other than this um, mechanistic whole, and uh, naturalism is not the same as between theism uh, and atheism, necessarily, because you could be like Spinoza or something and be a pantheist. Uh, and that would be like an emergent God, a God which emerges from this total process, which there's nothing outside of. Um, you could have this kind of cosmic consciousness that would not be supernaturalist in C.S. Lewis's mm -hmm. definition. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, basically, um, supernaturalists. Uh, so, for instance, miracles, he just defines as an interference in nature, nature defined as this kind of mechanistic whole. And um, yeah, so those and are nature, the key definitions. Nature is what happens of itself. That's right. like, spontaneity. Yeah. yeah, spontaneity. So um, the rhythms and patterns of of the world, the natural world that we see around us, this is what C.S. Lewis defines as nature. And um, um, a miracle, therefore, is the um, intervention of a supernatural uh, um, being or force into nature, into the system, and doing something to the um, – doing something to the whole that wouldn't have happened on its own accord. So naturally, um, humans are not born of the, a, um, of, uh, of the Holy spirit, uh, descending into a woman, but that is how Jesus was, uh, conceived. So, um, this is a miracle because the, the um, natural world and miracle defined as the intervention of a supernatural force or being into nature, precisely because nature is this interlocking whole that where things occur um, naturally, which is to say on their own accord um, and um, uh, and deterministically as well. And um, the supernatural breaks this deterministic or this uh interlocking chain of causes and effects right yeah yeah and so the determinism thing is going to be key for one of lewis's arguments against naturalism because um well i don't know if we need to get into that yet but yeah determinism is a key thing yeah. you're not a naturalist strictly speaking unless you think that there is 
in some basic sense, determinism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and compatibilism would be included in that. Like you don't mm -hmm. escape that from compatibilism. Mm -hmm. um, Cause yeah, he, basically, so should we get right into the arguments against naturalism? Or should we yeah, position yeah I think we probably should, yeah. Okay, so one of his key ones is essentially an epistemological point that um, causes are not reasons for belief. Right. So you can't have a situation in which your reasons for believing something are reducible to causes without invalidating that in rational terms. So yeah, basically, if, if you look at the literature on what defines knowledge, like epistemological literature, going back to Plato, knowledge is usually defined as justified true belief. And even models that don't say that is the total definition of knowledge include those things. And basically, if you're deterministic, as any true naturalist is, that's going to undermine your ability to have knowledge from C.S. Lewis's point of view. Um, so no naturalist can actually have knowledge of anything. Um, because in that system, your thoughts are merely deterministic processes and the result of causes. So your rational discursive reasoning process uh, is not spontaneous because spontaneity is something that's had only by nature as a whole and the parts of nature don't have uh, spontaneity. Right. They're uh, mechanistically interlocked with each other such that there could be no um, spontaneity. And so hence, basically all of your reasoning processes are reducible to causes. And we can see that even in um, like normal uh, disputation with people. So, you know, one of the most common ways to um, refute someone an argument at a popular level not necessarily um, in just like a kind of um, like a proletarian way, like would be um, basically, you know, you say, think such and such because you're such and such. So, right. you know, you agree with capitalism because you're a capitalist, right. you know, you agree with such and such because you're a, a merely a woman or merely, you know, you're an idiot or something like, or maybe not an idiot, that, yeah. little, uh, but basically, yeah, th the way to refute someone in a popular level argument which re represents an intuitive recognition of this fact that causes are not reasons right. is to basically say they're caused to there's something mm -hmm. impinging on their ability to freely reason which is making them think such or argue such mm -hmm. now yeah basically mm -hmm. this is the, the key point for lewis is if naturalism is true and all of our thoughts are the result of a deter deter deterministic process we can't actually have knowledge of anything um because you can't, you can't have justification. So if you look at the definition of knowledge is generally given justified true belief, you can't have justification and um, and have it be the result of causes because causes are not, are not, are not reasons. You can't have uh, irrational causes producing reason. Mm -hmm. So that's the key thing there. And that would make uh, the reasoning process, the reasoning faculty of man supernatural on Lewis's definition. So that's a, a key uh, defeater for Lewis of natu the naturalistic position because the naturalist, in order to argue for naturalism, has to assume human reason. And in order to assume human reason, he has to assume it's outside of the mechanistic um, determination process of nature and therefore put it up as something supernatural, as right. in outside of nature. Right. Yeah, this yeah. is um, this is something that um, Dimitri Staniloy talks about in the first chapter of the Experience of God series. He talks about how man is the center of reality understood properly because man knows nature. There's an asymmetry between us knowing nature, but nature does not know us. So the um, animals and the uh, the object the um, the plants didn't name Adam. Adam named the animals. So um, man as the conscious rational being who has been endowed endowed with reason as image of god has the capability to um to um, engage in intentional acts um so um consciousness is always intentional as we know from husserl and phenomenology there's always um i'm always conscious of something and this being conscious of something as such conscious of a chair as a chair this sort of consciousness is the only type of consciousness that um that is the type of consciousness that human humans have alone other animals don't know a chair as a chair <laughs> bless you but um they only they they only know it as an immediacy but haven't yet um reflected upon it and known it as and named it right. as something that it is now this naming and this knowing something as something this intentionality of consciousness um is for one lewis mentions this expl explicitly um it's always grounded in a um, more primordial, I think, um, of of Kant. The uh, the technical term is um, transcendental 
our perception. This, I think, is always underlying all of our thoughts. And that's what makes it that that is why we can have intentional thoughts, because you can only um, have something can only be for you if there is a you who it, it is for. So you can only be able to name and know objects right. if there is a conscious you underneath that. And this and that illustrates yeah. a really clear qualitative difference between right. human existence and other kinds of existence that should make it pretty clear they're not the same thing fundamentally mm -hmm. uh, or at least there has to be some kind of separation man cannot merely be part of this um great machine in which all of his uh it's just this this reign of quantity is this pure quantity you know to to refer to um Genon. it had there has to be something qualitatively different about man and we experience that with a great immediacy so i think that that demonstrates pretty clearly that there's something other than merely nature that is going mm -hmm. on in man to use mm -hmm. uh, lewis's definition of nature yeah. So man is always transcendent from nature and transcendent in the precise sense that we can name nature, but nature can't name, name us. So there's an asymmetry there. And that's why, like, this is kind of a digression, but um, people who see the fall of Adam as the origin of self-consciousness. Um, I remember Jordan Peterson said this one once, but it's a very old view. I'm, I'm, I believe probably the Gnostics sell to it. I know Hegel it, did. It's uh, Kabbalistic too. Yeah. Yeah. So the problem with that is that um, consciousness, it's not a fall. Consciousness is something higher than um, than the natural world. So um, and and I mean, in terms of the actual story itself, um, Adam is naming and speaking with naming the animals and speaking with God beforehand. So obviously the author believes that Adam and Eve were self-conscious. The fall is just a um a break from the harmonious consciousness that um, was present in Eden before the fall. Now, anyways, um, it can't be a fall. And my, my point here is that it's not lower than nature. Consciousness isn't lower than nature. It is by definition higher because we are able to look upon nature from this transcendent perspective. Um, and um, this is, this signifies um, that man is, um, outside of and beyond and in some ways um the sovereign over uh uh the natural processes that um and, and the natural whole that we throughout the book lewis calls nature so um mm -hmm. that is this is very important because this is c.s lewis's critique of naturalism um or at least one of them it's the fact that um that consciousness is always in order to have any consciousness at all um we need to we can't believe in pure naturalism. Yeah. Now, yeah. Um, um, just, there's there's a quote from Miracles um, that kind of puts this argument very concisely. Uh, if my mental processes are determined wholly by the motions of atoms in my brain, I have no reason to suppose that my beliefs are true. And hence, I have no reason for supposing my brain to be composed of atoms. Mm. Yeah. Pure materialism is just, right. it's, it's a self-defeating concept. I believe this is like right. uh, Alvin... Plantinga's argument? Yeah, so Plantinga takes a lot of stuff from miracles. He also uh, bases his uh, evolutionary argument against naturalism mm. on miracles as well. But C.S. Lewis makes the point that, so he's quoting Haldane there, Professor Haldane, mm. who's this British uh, scientist. Um, that's where that quote in miracles is from originally. He's, he's alluding to another author. But he makes the point that um, not merely materialism would result in the impossibility of knowledge, but also any kind of deterministic system. So he's not defining materialism and naturalism synonymously. Like I said, um, some kind of cosmic consciousness, Spinozan God, would still be naturalistic for right, Lewis. Right. So, yeah. 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 And it's like, um, this is the point you made earlier about causes versus uh, justified reasons. Um, causes usually have nothing to do with reasons at all. In fact, like, so if we were going to say that all of our thoughts are the product of just atoms in our brain, these causes, um, and, and then square that with naturalism, which, um, um, or, or sorry, evolution, uh, evolutionism, which teaches that, um, uh, our thoughts didn't evolve to find the truth, but to um, for our own survival. Right. Um, there is no reason to believe that these causes are bringing us towards the truth at all. And then it's, it's self-undermining or at yeah. least very, very arbitrary and subjective. Um, so, for example, um, the example you gave with um, – finding reasons for, for, sorry, finding causes for a certain belief actually undermines the belief. So um, one example that Lewis talks about um, in the book is how people will, or anth 
uh, sociologists and historians will often make the argument that um, the belief in the one God is the product of living in a monarchical society so that the monarchy and the notion of having one supreme le leader kind of uh, flowed into all aspects of the culture, including religion. Now, the problem with that is that you could equally say that um, belief in uh, um, naturalism and this whole uh, democratic whole kind of is a result of democracy where everything has um, its own say and there is no sovereign over it. Um, like this could very well be the product of of naturalism. So the idea that um, supernaturalism is a result of monarchy just um, square, uh, if you include with within that the idea that you could you, you could say that um, uh, naturalism is a result of living in a democratic society, they cancel each other out and they're non arguments. But the point is that if this were to be true and that supernatural supernaturalism is the cause of supernaturalism is the result of of uh, living in a monarchical society, this would really give you pause and probably uh, make you less um, less inclined to believe that it actually is true because the reasons are not rational. They're just causes within the, the uh, social organism or um, in terms of our thoughts, it would just be the, um, the atoms and neurons in our brain. Right, yeah. yeah. So determinism, if naturalism is true and determinism is true, therefore, it would have to be um, just as much of an impossibility as a logical contradiction that you wouldn't be watching this video right now. Um, there could, there are no other possible worlds besides the one in which we inhabit presently. So yeah, absolute determinism undermines knowledge. Uh, it would make uh, basically physical laws or um, the fact that you are doing something and not the other thing just as immutable as the laws of logic, which they aren't. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, I think I think the fundamental point that Lewis is making in his arguments against determinism and naturalism is connected to the work that we've been doing for the past like, year or so on communal ontology, where it's impossible to have a self a self enclosed system. It, it's impossible to have a set that accounts for all sets. Right. That's that's. Um, that, that that's a that's a problem that's been plaguing philosophy for a very long time how do you get the set which contains all sets how do you get this 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 system of complete totality which uh understands and uh, and completes and, and accounts for everything right and anybody who's familiar with the work of jonathan pajot or with the work of telos bound in the past would know that this is an impossibility you you cannot have a self-enclosed system that accounts for all things there has to always be that transcendent that openness towards whether it's god or just a higher plane of existence or there, there has to be openness towards something that allows that system to exist in the first place and talking about how the the materialist or the naturalist position is fundamentally self-defeating we can see this just in the current scientific theories about how the world is going to end the based on the the laws of thermodynamics the universe as it, as it exists today is a self-defeating system it will kill itself because it's impossible for a system to survive without anything beyond it sustaining it actively sustaining it in existence there has to be that transcendent there has to be that sabbatical opening up towards that which allows that system to exist in the first place Right. And so when we're talking about um, sort of like the um, openness towards something other in terms of nature, what is that openness towards um, the otherness outside of the self-enclosed system is humanity. Man is. So this is, relates back to what uh, Stanilo was saying in the first chapter of the experience of God. And I think there's a reason he opened up his whole dogmatic theology series with this chapter. Um, yeah. it's, it's that man as the image of God is that being who knows nature and therefore grasps and com comprehends it, not necessarily, not from purely from outside of it, but, um, in a manner that, um, from within it, there, is, it, it forms part of the hierarchy of communion up in 
from uh, nature, man, and then God, right? So this is the traditional hierarchy of being um, in, in Christianity. Um, and it's not necessarily a higher, it's not a Neoplatonic hierarchy of where you where there can't be true communion. Like we truly are, it is true to say that we are part of nature, but it's also true to say that the, we are part of supernature. That is what it means to be a microcosm of all creation. We are a microcosm of of the whole uh, natural world and also the spiritual world. We are that bridge between spirit and matter. And it's not because we are some hypostasis to go back to the Neoplatonic example, which is just like a lower form of what is like our spirit is not a lower form of spirit. And this lowerness allows us to interact with matter, which is lower. Um, it's that we in us, we have true spirit in us. And there is a communion, a literal communion in us, a union of matter and spirit. Um, and on that note, um, what we, we should emphasize that when Lewis is critiquing um, naturalism on the basis of reasons and the fact that naturalism as um, ha necessarily by being a philosophy has to claim to have justified reasons um, undermines itself because there can't be justification or reason within uh, naturalism. Um, the, the crucial point is that we're not talking about mind versus matter. This is not, um, while that may exist, there may be a distinction between mind versus matter. Um, Lewis's argument doesn't hinge on mind versus matter, but reason versus matter, because reason is precisely that thing which outs is outside of the natural whole, uh, outside of the system, and able to name it as what it is. Um, and this, um, and as Nate was saying, the problem with the problem of uh, the philosophical term is imminence, the problem of being trapped within your own self-relation, this closed system with nothing outside of it, which is equivalent to the 666, the beast, um, that is not open to, open to the seventh day, which is the day of rest, the Sabbath. Um, the, the reason why, um, uh, sorry, lost my train of thought there. The reason, oh yeah, the reason why, um, this, uh, this, this six day is, uh, or the natural hold, the imminent closed system is, cannot have reasons is precisely because to um, know something and to um, use your reason to speak and um, um, and to speak of something and to know it as something necessarily means to be outside of the pure immediacy of that something in order to name it for what it is to perform that abstraction of thought to say and and to know it as in terms of the system of universals that we only humans in the natural world are able to know so so that we can say this is a green tree this is a hard tree this is a living tree all of these ideas these concepts are only known by us and um in order to have a tree as a tree to know it as a tree there there has to be a mind which is able from outside to provide that definition for what it is so this is why there has to be this otherness outside of the closed system of of naturalism and one last point i'll make on that is that this otherness even applies to god himself there has to be and this is why god is triune in christianity the father that a unitarian god falls into the same problems as a unitarian subject or a closed system of naturalism um the the father cannot know himself he cannot love himself he cannot act because uh the father alone that is because without um another person that he can move towards without another person that he can know himself in um you fall into this problem of the um a uh, bad infinity of self-reference where um in terms of subjectivity, you try to know yourself, but this very knowing is already outside of your knowledge. So like, um, it's like an eyeball trying to stare back at itself to use an example I always use. Um, and this only points to the fact that there has to be this sort of transcendent, um, this sort of transcendence in order to have any reasons at all in order to have any uh, knowledge whatsoever. And this transcendence isn't accounted for within the philosophy of naturalism. Yeah, to, or to use a, an example that C.S. Lewis uses in the Cosmic Trilogy, uh, fallen man is the subject who tries to stand on its own shoulders. That That's impossible. It, that's it's what impossible Zizek have, uses as well. Yeah. Uh, uh, is that what 
I, I know that Lewis said something. Like, is that exact? Is that what Lewis? Said? Um, I no, I, I know what you're talking about. Something is... like, oh, he tries to generate, uh, generate offspring on his own or something like that. Yeah. It's the same concept yeah. of trying to create something uh, without the other allowing you or giving mm-hmm. you room to mm-hmm. create. It's it's an impossibility. So C.S. Lewis fundamentally understood this concept of communal ontology, which is fundamentally just the notion which makes christianity uniquely true there is no other worldview that accounts for this uh necessity of communion to the same degree that christianity does and i think that on this note we can talk about the specific uh sort of function of miracles as miracles as uh as allhart was saying earlier interruptions in the natural order because they they are interruptions in natural order but they're not just these foreign breakthroughs in, in this sort of like complete whole like it's not like nature is this complete whole and then miracles just kind of come in from outside and break it apart the natural order of the natural world is towards miracles the six days of creation flow towards the seventh naturally they're supposed to move up towards the transcendent mm-hmm. breaking through mm-hmm. of a higher order into the mundanity of the uh, of the of the of the natural world, so we, interior to the very na- interior to nature itself is this movement towards the transcendent, which goes beyond nature, and that's because interior to nature itself is the seed of God planted in nature that allows it to exist in the first place. Because as we were just as I lost my train of thought because of Trey, uh, as uh, as we were just saying, it's impossible for something to exist unless there's something other allowing it to exist in the first place. And um, so interior to nature existing is God's giving it room to exist, which means that the movement of nature is to the creator, which is giving it room to exist in the first place. That is interior to its very existence and telos. Uh, nature is telos bound. It's bound to its telos. Um, and this is what miracles are. Miracles are the fulfillment of the natural order towards that which nature is supposed to move towards. It's the it's the eschatological bringing in of what nature is supposed to be into what nature is right now. It's the it's the bringing together of the ought and the is, um, the bringing together of the now and not yet. Uh, and C.S. Lewis talks about this, like with the with the virgin birth. He talks about how there is a fundamental similarity between the virgin birth and all other births of other people in the natural order it's just that the virgin birth is sort of like the perfect completed version of the the births that came before christ it's it's not that um to to say that mary conceived from the holy spirit is not to say that every other birth that has happened before didn't happen through the Holy Spirit creating a new person. It's just to say that this happened on a higher level of that miraculous conception through the mediation of God. And I mean, if we look in Genesis 4, uh, Eve says, uh, I have begotten a son by the Lord, Seth. The, the, the seed of the woman is begotten of by the Lord. It's, it's not just that Adam and Eve had a son, and then in a completely fundamentally foreign context, Mary had a son just by the work of the Holy Spirit. It's that interior to the very notion of women bearing seed is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, allowing the human family to fulfill its telos in filling the earth. It just so happens that in Mary, this begetting of a son by the Lord, which happened also with Eve, found its fulfillment in absolute chastity and virginal purity, bringing forth life in its highest form she she gave room to the highest order directly instead of through someone else like like eve did with adam yeah c.s lewis makes this point later in the book he he points out that the miracles of christ are not like the miracles of you know pagan mythology or something where it's just this kind of uh uh some like this like delightful nonsense is what kind of what he calls it uh they they represent the patterns of nature at a larger scale so they're, they're at more total representation of the patterns of nature than nature itself so they're not qualitatively uh, alien to nature but also express nature 
And in that sense, they're much more plausible because they represent the acts of a God who values nature uh, and who created it and sees uh, it as something good as reflecting him. So yeah, it's, it's not merely this, the kind of, um, you know, delightful nonsense of pagan mythology or of, uh, not that there isn't some kind of symbolic significance to those things either, but uh, they're, they're of a distinctly different category than uh, other miracles purported in various other world religions or uh, uh, mythological narratives. And so, yeah, you mentioned the natural laws. Yeah, so for one, uh, natural laws are basically just the, uh, the um, mathematical formulations of reality as we generally experience it, which cannot be universalized to the extent like the laws of reason can. They're not the same kind of thing. But even if you were to like look at the structure of, you know, quote unquote laws of nature, they're basically just that you know, they, they boil down to if A, then B. Um, and it says nothing about how you come by A. So that still leaves room for the miraculous to step in. Um, so yeah, it's simply, the laws of nature are not like the laws of logic. They, yeah. it's, it doesn't simply become nonsense to say the, you know, the laws of nature have been interrupted or um, have been manifested in a different way than usual. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, one thing you're hinting at, Alhart, is that um, the the types of miracles that you see in the gospel don't, don't represent this foreign intruder, but actually um, they seem to suggest that the person performing the miracles is the sovereign over the natural world and created the natural world so that the order in the writ like this. I mean, if you um, know anything about medieval um, and ancient Christian cosmology, and, and I'm sure Jewish as well. Um, the the heavens and and just um, nature itself was seen as a reflection of the life of God and the harmony that we see um, with um, one the heavenly bodies um, in their orbits and uh, in the natural processes of the seasons and of uh, day and night all of these were seen to reflect the divine order and harmony of God so um, Christ coming for example and when 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 Christ comes and he um, turns water into wine this isn't the equivalent of some ancient pagan myth where for example um uh, a god turns a man into a frog or something like that these types of miracles are just arbitrary they seem they don't seem to they don't complement the natural order the way um christ uh turning water into wine does um they show they almost seem like a um a um an opposition to the natural order and a foreign intruder acting upon it. Um, but with Christ, he turns water into wine, but water turns into wine um, all the time. <laughs> like um, not water just alone, but like the, the, the water in the grapes turns um, is part of that process of fermentation that becomes wine. So Christ is just doing this in a local specific um, um, he's doing what he's always done since the creation of uh, grapes he, he's been um he, he's doing that um quickly in a more quicker and unique way in a lo localized area yeah, when at, he at turns a higher, water at a higher level yeah yeah he's, so yeah, yeah. He's so showing right. he's showing what the process of the grape plants taking up water and then transforming yeah. it into grapes which then ferment into alcohol he's showing what that process mm -hmm. ultimately symbolizes mm -hmm. and what that process ultimately symbolizes because that's just a lower reflection of a higher cosmic process that happens in the life of god ultimately but also in the acts of god in creation through man and what that is it's it's the eucharistic task of reaching down into the waters below bringing it up transforming it which is what the great plant does it takes the water from below it takes the sun from above it mixes them together it creates grapes which then are transformed into wine for us to drink as uh, as a form of communion with god and jesus is just sowing that this communal Eucharistic bringing together the waters below with the transcendent God above who is the sovereign over these waters below and is the one who allows these waters below to exist in the first place and allows them to transform into unique greater things. He's showing how that happens on the highest scale possible. Every act of Jesus's miracles are fully compatible with natural processes the 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 production of bread and fish the transformation of water into wine uh, all of these things happen in the real world 
on a mon mundane natural level all the time. Jesus is just showing how all of these natural processes find their ultimate fulfillment in the transcendent processes which allow these natural processes to exist in the first place. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that a sort of a prima facie reason for a, a, a non-Christian to accept or be more inclined towards the miracles of Christ is the fact that they seem to suggest or they seem to reflect the um, a sovereign God who has made nature. They don't like the reason why you should be less inclined to believe in the miracles in um, that you see in, for example, Greek mythology is the fact that if you were to believe that these miracles are actually true, this is something Lewis says, like it would be um, a nightmare. Like if you truly believe that um, all this crazy stuff happened with, again, like men being turned into animals or st stuff like the these types of miracles seem arbitrary they seem to be the result of someone who did not create the natural um processes of uh of creation as something as that's an inherent good um they seem to just be arbitrary in the result of wrathful um and self-willing self-willing and um uh even malevolent beings so um the miracles of the gospel are quite different, and for that reason, uh, one should be more open-minded towards them. Towards them. Now, on that note, um, we can go back to something that I opened this um, our 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 talk with, and that is the fact that miracles do happen all the time. Um, and now that we've sort of refuted naturalism or did our best to, um, we sh um, we can now talk about miracles as such a bit more because miracles happen all the time. If someone says that miracles don't happen or they no longer happen, that is just false. It's just a result of ignorance. It's just, um, it's just not true. Uh, miracles are re reported every day, which isn't to say all miracles are from a benevolent, from benevolent beings. Um, just that miracles do happen every day. And there are cultures around the world where miracles occurring or disruptions into the natural order of things which is how we've defined miracles um but by disruptions by some sort of supernatural being who has authority over nature this is almost a given in i would say probably the majority of countries around the world um the, the idea that miracles occur is not something disputed it is very a very specific in both in time and place very specific belief um, typically by Westerners, that miracles don't occur and because the philosophy of naturalism is very, very specific to um, uh, to our um, our place and time. But um, if if naturalism is not a given, if naturalism isn't um, the most rational and uh, uh, most rational and obvious belief system, then you should be more open to miracles being real because miracles are reported. Uh, all the time. And uh, in terms of, for example, with the Gospels, um, people have gone so far as to to say that um, um, the Gospel, uh, the, the accounts of Christ's resurrection and all his, his appearances to the disciples were mass hallucinations, which is the same thing they said about Fatima. Not, not, to, comment, not to comment on that, but um, the, uh, the, uh, the, this just only makes sense if you are presupposing Naturalism. begging the question yeah begging you're completely the begging the question so i don't know all heart do you want to talk about that a bit more about how um naturalism often begs the question and that's why they're led to their belief that there actually are no right. miracles you, you only yeah. got to that belief because you don't believe in them <laughs> yeah c.s lewis mentions this when he comments on a popular um translation and commentary on the bible in his time he points out that in the gospel of john there's a, a note from the translator that says it's, it's talking about the date when the jo Gospel of John was written, and it says um, the Gospel of John must have been written after the execution of Saint Peter because it predicts that Saint Peter will be executed, and so that's the most like obvious example of begging the question ever because you're assuming that there is no such thing as miraculous prediction, um, and it, it's the reasons for uh, the uh, translator believing that are never expressed in the book, so it's simply question begging in the context, and it's and the reason for that believing that is never provided. Um, so yeah, that's an example that he gives of basically question begging being at the root of rejection of miracles uh, by many people who comment on it. Yeah, uh, real quick, um, 
the, we see the exact same thing in biblical commentators today. Almost every single academic dismisses Daniel as um, having been written uh, in, in the time that it, it says to have been written because it accurately prophesies events that happened after it was written. And they're like, right. well, obviously miracles don't exist. Obviously prophecy yeah. isn't real. So it couldn't have been written when it, when it was said to have been written. But it's like, yeah. if you, if these people would just take James Jordan's advice, take Sarah from Hamilton's advice, just take Jonathan Pajot's advice, read the Bible as if it were true. And you'll be shocked to see, okay, maybe this doesn't make sense. You'll, you'll be shocked. Yeah. Just, just, just suppose that miracles could exist and they will happen. How do you respond to people who would say, oh, that itself is question begging, because that's going to color your results, too. If you assume the Bible, it could at least potentially be true, and you read, you're, you're coloring your results to begin with. Yeah. In the opposite direction. Well, I think if you want to really get down to the brass tacks of formulating like a logical reason to believe in Christianity, you have to go a different, whoops, you have to go a different route than just uh, assume the Bible's true and read it and see how your life changes. But from a practical approach, I think that that's a, that's a solid argument because it works like on a, on a practical level, not on a philosophical, you know, intellectual argument level. It just, just for the average person, that's, that's a solid argument because it, it works. If you just suppose the existence of miracles, they, mm -hmm. they will happen mm -hmm. to you because they're real, but on on a level of like intellectual argument like oh that's just begging the question then i think you have to go down a different path and then right, use right. like tra uh, transcendental argument and and go down the path of presuppositions but uh or or use the cosmological argument or something like that but i i think on a practical level it's it's very useful to just assume the bible's true and see how your life changes because of it and and you will see and and it's it's right some something that uh seraphim has talked about and that i've that i've employed a few times is when you're arguing with atheists ask them just ask them to just pray once just literally just tell them to ask god to reveal himself to them because it's like in their in their worldview the only thing that they're risking is like three seconds worth of a little bit of embarrassment that's all they're risking they're risking three seconds of embarrassment and they could potentially gain literally everything. So whenever you're engaging with an atheist, something that is productive, I find in most cases, Sarah from Hamilton obviously thinks it's productive because he does it every time he engages with atheists, apparently, is just tell them, try it out. Like you, you literally, in your worldview, you are, you are losing nothing by trying it out other than a couple seconds worth of embarrassment. Right. And so long as the... So long as the fact that you may be wrong is within the realm of possibility, which it always is for every single one of us, including us three, there's always a possibility that we could be wrong about any given thing at any given moment. So long as that possibility exists, you have no reason not to try praying. It's almost like a better form of Pascal's wager. Yeah. I think. Yeah. 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 And it, it might not be the most like logical or rational argument. There are much better logical and rational arguments that you can use, like tag and the cosmological argument, which I think are pretty, pretty indisputable. But on a practical level, that is unbeatable. Yeah. I would like to. So basically, I presented earlier C.S. Lewis's reason for rejecting naturalism. Like I said, Plantinga and some other philosophers have taken this up. Basically, Reason has to be supernatural. Uh, the act of reasoning uh, has to be, reason as a faculty has to be beyond the web of causes, deterministic causes, which everything else is bound up in. Um, so hence nationalism can't be true. Uh, naturalism can't be true because um, it would have to, you basically have to assume a supernatural faculty to prove naturalism. So it just doesn't work. But the question is like, how do you get from supernatural reason to a supernatural God? supernatural rational god and so i'd like to present that argument um, from chapter four of miracles real quick and then um maybe talk a little bit about how it gets responded to by uh like non-reductive naturalists um so i'll just present that real quick if you don't mind so the first point so first the the, the argument i made before is 
something other than nature has to exist, namely reason, for us to even know anything. But the question is, okay, how do we get to God? Well, here's this. Since everything in nature can be wholly explained in terms of non-rational causes, human reason, more precisely the power of drawing conclusions based solely on the rational cause of logical insight, must have a source outside of nature. If human reason came from non-reason, it would lose all rational credentials and would cease to be reason. Okay. So human reason cannot come from non-reason. So human reason must come from a source outside of nature that is itself rational. This supernatural source of reason may itself be dependent on some further source of reason, but a chain of reason of such independent sources cannot go on forever. So that's, you can't have a, uh, infinite regress, right? Eventually, we must reach back, um, we must reason back to the existence of an eternal non-dependent source of human reason. Therefore, there exists an eternal, self-existent, rational being who is the ultimate source of human reason. This being we call God. Any thoughts on that? Absolutely solid argument. Yeah, I think so too. Now, the way this gets responded to is, um, so they're like non-reductive naturalists um, that are floating around today. They, they don't have this kind of uh, lo logical positivist uh, worldview mm. Um, like cognitive science guys like John Verbeke you would maybe be in this category. Um, yeah, yeah. Although I will state that the reductive naturalism, the logical positivism of the 19th century and of Lewis's time is still very much alive in scientific circles. Uh, you need only see like Jonathan Pajot's conversation with like one of the Weinstein brothers to see like this is still very much alive in many sectors of and academia. In, in terms of popular culture, I, I think the popular naturalism that people believe, and this was sort of the naturalism that people got with uh, new atheism and from Dawkins and stuff, this is the type of naturalism you're um, you're exposed to. And yeah, it's it's yeah. interesting how um, yeah, yeah it, it's interesting how um, prevalent it is. It's just now. taken for granted in yeah. most scientific fields, like physicists, chemists, biologists. They they have no reason to question their presuppositions on epistemology. They they have no reason to do that because they're not operating on that plane. They're, they're just taking for granted that reality is reductive. And that's, that's, that's yeah. irrational. Like you could imagine like a, a character in the great divorce, who's like a biologist who is, who kept, who he's like in yeah. the direct presence of like an archangel, but keeps like um, being concerned over like proving it with a proving, uh, <laughs> proving salvation through yeah. uh, test tubes or whatever. Like this is like a, well, yeah. Doesn't C.S. Lewis talk about that somewhere where it's like... Um, there's a painter, there's... Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if it's in The Great Divorce that he talks about this, but I'm pretty sure it's C.S. Lewis. It might be Tolkien, it might be someone else, but they talk about how the, the sort of like rational skeptics in hell, they're going to spend the entire time trying to rationalize the fact that they are in hell. They're oh, he's, be, he says gonna... that in Miracles. He yes, says, yes. If you're okay, thrown into okay. the lake of fire... Yeah, that's terrible. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> terrible. Uh, what's that guy? I don't. The I guy whoever all. does whoever does the uh, whoever does the um, uh, readings of the C.S. Lewis uh, essays though. It's quite good. I just can't do his voice. Um, but yeah, he says that like <laughs> whoever's thrown into the lake of fire, um, he, he'll be thrown into the lake of fire, and he'll still. Uh, oh yeah, a materialist thrown into the lake of fire who believes all. Um, uh, the ideas of the afterlife or like experience of ghosts and stuff it are pure illusions he'll be in the in the lake of fire still trying to convince everyone with yeah. him that yeah. it's everything's an illusion <laughs> yeah so yeah. Uh, i mentioned these non-reductive naturalists who are are in certain philosophical circles and in um and in cognitive science mm. so they'll point out that like um so they, they don't hold to a democratic universe in the way uh lewis describes you know um what we would call reductive naturalism uh in the sense there's like nothing which is above anything else they believe in reason and they believe things that that must be outside nature as it's construed in in uh purely mechanistic terms but uh so they'll the, the way they'll respond is you're just like not accounting for um emergence they use this term it's really popular in those yeah. circles like emergence the emergence of consciousness from things that are you know other than consciousness or other than um it's kind of a complex uh, process where, you know, somehow quality emerges from quantity. I'm not really sure how they explain that. And uh, David Bentley Hart, who you've responded to, but actually made a good point here, it has said, anytime 
uh, someone says emergence, just replace it with magic because yeah. that's about all you're getting from them is mm-hmm. just, oh, stuff happens. Like we somehow get this shift from uh, quantity to quality that produces like a radically different result. Uh, it's not a very fleshed out concept. It's highly disputed in terms of its meaning. They know it has to exist in some sense. Like there has to be emergence, um, but uh, the, the it's not really fleshed out and it's not really an adequate response to what C.S. Lewis is putting forward here with an argument, yeah. the argument for from reason uh, to a rational God. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That they they are presupposing miracles, just like every other system. Does. Right, right. Uh, I I right. can't remember if it's Richard Dawkins or Stephen Hawking, one of the two. Maybe it's someone else, and I'm just dumb. Someone, some atheist, has the quote where it's like every system requires a miracle grant science one miracle and we'll explain everything else that miracle being the big bang it's like every every system needs something that they can't explain there has to be with in any system of logic there has to be something that cannot be explained there has to be miracles there has to be that sabbath day of rest where you can't explain it that right. has to be there in any given system or else that system devours itself it, yeah. it falls victim to girdles the of of dynamics yeah. yeah exactly the set of all sets needs a set outside of itself there there has to be something that feeds energy into the system so that it doesn't die a heat death and, and this is exactly what lewis says like he talks about how if we're defining a miracle as with something within the total sis uh sorry if we're defining uh, a miracle as something unexplained unaccounted for and doesn't not naturally occurring within the cause and effect uh interlocked cause and effect systematic whole that we call nature then nature as such is one great miracle um exactly. and um another thing he says is that uh naturalists this is basically a quote i think naturalists spend so much time thinking about nature they forget they are thinking um because as we were saying thinking thinking That's is a good one above, yeah it's above uh it's above uh nature understood as just series of cause and effect because reason is not a cause nor an effect or is not reducible uh to either because you can't get reason from uh from your cause um now one thing we were going to talk about or we kind of did but i i think it's worth touching on is the fact that um i think from a uh the pers- reading the Bible, understanding the evidence for the gospel the, of the gospels, and um, from within the gospels themselves, um, the idea that, for example, all of the gospels that mention, um, I don't know if all of the gospels do. I know most of them, me- at least, mention um, the destruction of the temple uh, that that Christ prophesies. <laughs> um, if uh, and also um, one some, one of the biblical uh, one of the New Testament texts prophesies the death of Peter. Um, one of the Gospels, do I'm pretty sure. Anyways, though, obviously all these events which occur after the events written about in the go- – all of the events prophesied in the Gospels, um, obviously for the nat- or the uh, non-Christian, these events – the, the gospels need to have been written after the events prophesied occurred. And Lewis opens the book uh, by m- talking about how um, the biblical scholars were, well, there's a, there was a famous biblical scholar around his time who argued that the book, which prophesied about the martyrdom of St. Peter obviously had to be written after the martyrdom because events can't um, events can't be um, written about. Or... Yeah. That, but this is just Miraculously. completely, this is completely begging the question obviously and this is why lewis we uh, us and lewis spent so much time uh arguing against naturalism and the presuppositions because once you take away that presuppositions you can actually look at the evidence um clear head uh with a clear head um and you could not necessarily just that but you can take the worldview as the worldview and actually look at its internal coherence because if your worldview already um makes another worldview such as Christianity incoherent, you're never going to actually look at the worldview itself. And these are your presuppositions. And this is why we need to go at them first. But in terms of Christianity, um, looking at it without the presupposition that miracles can occur, um, the idea that the gospels were written um, after 70 AD, so after the destruction of the temple or after Peter's martyrdom is just ridiculous. It's just, for one, um, Paul quotes Every single gospel aside from uh, one, 
uh, like directly quotes, like clearly quotes, and he even refers to it as a sacred text. Um, and and all scholars even agree that that Paul's um, epistles are written before 70 AD. So there's no, um, <laughs> it just doesn't make sense. Like in terms of the actual evidence that we have, without the presupposition that miracles and prophecies, predictions can occur, the evidence points to actual um, prophecies occurring, uh, Jesus actually prophesying stuff. Therefore, Jesus was divine. Like that That would be our um part of our argument towards the divinity of Jesus. But um, yeah, like the gospel accounts, like for one, the gospels um, are the most, in uh, the, the New Testament as a whole, the most well-preserved ancient manuscripts that we have by far, like by, by an, far, an, an by absurd thousands. amount. Yeah. In terms of the years that we have them, um, like the earliest man surviving manuscripts, they're by far the earliest, like people most people don't even know that we don't have an existing copy of any of, of Aristotle's works until the Middle Ages. There's no existing copy from ancient Greece of Aristotle's works. Um, but we, but, and then there are people who deny that um, there's no one, like, what's that guy's name? Uh, Matt, the guy, <laughs> the guy Seraphim debated when he was a kid. Matt, um, is that uh, his name? Dillahunty. Dilla yeah, Matt Dillahunty. I'm pretty sure he's a, a mythicist. And is he an Aristotle mythicist? No. The only reason why he is, it has nothing to do, no matter what he says, it's nothing to do with the evidence we have. Because if he's actually looking at the evidence we have, there is absolutely no reason to believe in Plato, Socrates, or Aristotle, and yet or deny Julius Christ. Or Julius Caesar. Or Julius Caesar. Right. Um, and he doesn't deny these people. He only yeah. denies Christ because the um, the stories are filled with stuff that his worldview already rejects. Yeah, I made this point in the comments section of one of these clips from the Millet, uh, Matt Dillahunty and um, Trent Horn debate. Like if you actually took his criticism seriously, you just end up with a situation where you could have no historical knowledge whatsoever. You just like totally gut history as a field entirely. Um, yeah, exactly. It's, it's just not a tenable position uh, by, yeah. So if you're not presupposing the impossibility of these things from some kind of uh, philosophical perspective, you have no reason to reject the, the occurrence of miracles in history. Uh, so they just end up begging the question, like we said already. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one thing I will say is, I remember um, Father Stephen DeYoung made this point, don't quote me on this, but he made the point that um, uh, when the Romans um, took to Jerusalem in 70 AD to destroy it and to like level the temple to the ground, um, all the Christians were already out of the city. So they must have already known, they must have taken Christ's advice and, and taken to the hills. Um, so that shows also that uh, there was some kind of knowledge of that. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, something something that goes along with this in a bit of a tangen tangential way is uh, that <laughs> is that there there are other examples of prophecy, quote unquote, in more mundane aspects of our lives. I mean, there's that one book that was written late 1800s about a cruise liner called the Titan that crashed into an iceberg and th that was said to be indestructible, but ended up crashing into an iceberg and sinking. And then a few years later, the Titanic happened, which was a big cruise liner, which uh, was said to be indestructible, called the Titanic, not the Titan, but similar that crashed into an iceberg and sank. Like there are examples in not just these high cosmic spiritual events um, in, in just our mundane everyday lives. There are examples of prophecy uh, on a very simple mundane level. And this, this is just because this is the way reality works on a fractal level. There are, everything is a miracle. I mean, we look at the subatomic level, there is no reason for the, the subatomic particles coming together in a way that creates atoms. And then there's no reason for the atoms coming together in a way that then creates molecules which interact with each other in a way that's completely independent from the cause which the atoms are providing for the molecules as a whole to interact with each other. There is this emergence which happens on every level of reality from subatomic particles all the way up to Jesus transforming water into wine or uh, other other things that 
we would call miracles or prophetic like the like when um that one roman emperor tried to build the third the third temple to prove that christianity was untrue and then the earth literally opened up fire came out and killed everybody like that's 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 almost unbelievable other than the fact that it actually happened like there are miracles that happen on every level of existence that it goes all the way down to life itself being a miracle simply because there's no reason for the most mundane level of exi of existence the subatomic uh particles interacting with each other in the way that they do there's no reason for that to create what happens on the level above it and there's no reason for that to create what happens on the level above that so on and so forth so whenever we're looking at prophecies and miracles in the bible we're just looking at the highest form of prophecy that happens and we often fail to recognize the fact that this is just the highest form of miracle there are miracles that happen in our everyday lives all the time that we just don't recognize as miracles because we're not looking at it from the step below looking up at a miracle happening above us like we are when we're reading the bible we're looking at miracles that are happening imminent to us on a, on a lower level that's for some reason we think is logical and easier to understand even though they operate by the same principle of miraculous breaking through of a higher plane of existence onto a lower more mundane level of existence yeah. it's the same thing just on different right. levels yeah, and like cognitive science recognizes this, that's why they have to use the term emergence to talk about yeah. this. Um, they don't always have like a clear clear idea of what that means, which is why David Bentley Hart says it's basically, you can just replace that with magic. It's or, just- Or as, replace it with miracle, literally just replace it with, with miracle and- and Right, yeah, exactly. Yeah, boom. boom. Yeah, I think that's true. <laughs> yeah, cognitive science guys have no reason not to become a Christian anymore. Man. Well, yeah, yeah, I would recommend everyone go check out the conversations between uh, John Verbeke and Jonathan Pajot and J.P. Marceau. Those are really good. They talk about this Very book, too, some of them. Uh, and yeah, it's that's this is like a very serious conversation. And it tends in the direction of Christianity because this kind of naturalism, at least as it's generally construed in the sense Lewis means it is not tenable at all. Yep. Yep. Um, guys, True. so I need to get going now. I'm going to my grandma's house. But um, thank you for uh, joining me and speaking about this wonderful book, Miracles by C.S. Lewis. Everyone watching, please go check go it out for it. yourself. Yes, or you can listen to the audiobook on uh, uh, Audible. Um, and yeah, with that, um, again, thank you for joining us. And please like this video, subscribe to the channel, and most importantly, join our Discord server. The link is in the description. All right, everyone. God bless. God bless. Peace. Went to Mexico twice, did shows, meet and greets, never got COVID. Clearly, Jesus loves me the most. Seriously. So nice. So nice.